For more on this announcement, we're going to bring in Derek Pitts. He's the chief astronomer and planetarium director at the Franklin Institute, and he joins us from Philadelphia. Derek, what do you make of this announcement? I think this is a wonderful idea to build a spacecraft like this and send it out to get a good close look at the sun so it can answer a lot of the questions about the sun that we have not been able to answer. You know, we live so close to this very, very active star, and it's surprising uh, both on one hand how much we know, but on the other hand how little we know. And in this day and age of uh, all of the electronic technology that the world depends on, it's really, really important for us to better understand how the sun works. And so 3.8 million miles, that's the distance that this spacecraft will be as it gets, as it nears the sun. Uh, that doesn't sound like it's close, but it actually is very, very close. And I just sort of wonder what the technology is that protects a spacecraft from that intense heat. It's really wonderfully innovative technology. In fact, this mission could not have been done before this, this, this time in history because the materials that are needed to protect the spacecraft simply weren't available. So what's going to happen is this spacecraft is going to use four and a half inches, a four and a half inch thick sort of shield, if you will, made of carbon-carbon composite that's going to allow it to withstand the absolutely blistering heat of the sun at that point. You know, at that distance, the intensity of light from the sun is 3,000 times the intensity of light that we have here on the Earth. So it's going to be incredibly, incredibly hot. So that's one part of the protection that's going to be used. The other part of protection that's going to be used really is twofold. One is that the solar panels that are going to be generating electricity for the spacecraft and also used for um, sensor mounting are, will be foldable so that as they come in close to the sun, they'll be able to fold those panels out of the way so that they won't be, uh, won't be subjected to such great heat. But then as the spacecraft orbits out away from the sun, those panels can be deployed so that they can not only generate energy, but pull in the data they need. And at the same time, they're also going to use little tiny fingers that can poke out from behind the heat shield that will be able to withstand the temperatures so that they can gather the data they want to gather about the activity at the sun. So then what is the main purpose of this mission? What sort of information are they hoping to get? Well, interestingly enough, there are two aspects to this. One of them is like, almost like a pure science aspect, and the other one is very highly practical. The first one is that scientists really want to understand how the sun does what, it's, what it does. And what I mean by that is when you look at the surface of the sun, obviously you can see that the surface of the sun is very hot, and that makes sense because that's where all the energy is being generated. But up above the surface of the sun, the outer atmosphere of the sun called the corona, is much, much, much hotter. And scientists have no idea as to why that temperature is as high as it is. In other words, there's electron activity at that level that is unexplained. We don't know why the upper atmosphere of the, of the sun is millions of degrees in temperature when the surface of the sun is only about 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the first side. The second side that they want to understand about the sun is how does the sun generate the kind of solar wind that it generates. You know, the sun is pouring out electromagnetic particles all the time that bathe the entire solar system in these particles from the sun. In a sense, you can say all the planets of the sun are inside the sun's atmosphere, the extended atmosphere of the sun. But the real problem with this is we don't understand how it is that the sun creates big eruptions of gases and flares and prominences and these features that pour out very, very intense electronic activity. And the problem with this is that we are so dependent on our electronic technology these days. All of our computer systems, computer networks, communication, all of those things can be completely knocked out if we had a really intense solar flare or solar prominence. And of course, we cannot have that happen on our planet today. So we need to understand as much as we can so we can either protect against it or figure out when it's going to happen so we can shut systems down and then bring them back up once the flare is passed. That's one of the most important reasons. Derek, take us back to our eighth grade science class and explain to us uh, how a satellite like this can orbit such a large mass and not be pulled to the surface of the sun by its gravitational pull. And I'm guessing we're not going to get this spacecraft back. <laughs> Well, we won't get the spacecraft back, but it's a really interesting dance that's done with spacecraft to make them orbit in this way. What you do is you balance the pull of gravity from the object that's being studied. 
you balance that against the speed with which the spacecraft is approaching that object. When you balance the two just right, then what you can do is you can create an orbit. Now, the sun is enormous, right? It's almost a million miles in diameter for all those who are counting 864,000 miles in diameter. But just let's round it out to a million <laughs> just for fun and games, all right? So what you need to do with an object this massive in order to get something to orbit it without dropping into it is you need to get the velocity up pretty high. So this spacecraft is going to be traveling at 430,000 wow. miles per hour, which is an incredibly high wow. rate of speed. But that's what's necessary to get the balance just right so that it will orbit. There'll be 24 orbits around the sun, and it can do that without falling into the sun. All very interesting stuff. Yeah, hey, look, if it can cool. protect our electronics, that's good. When my <laughs> phone's at 1%, I start to hyperventilate. So it's all good. Derek Pitts for us in Philadelphia. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you.